Welcome to the StoryCraft Cafe. Come in, grab a cup of your favorite beverage, and get ready to join the storytelling conversation. StoryCraft Cafe is brought to you by Dabble, the ultimate cloud-based fiction writing software. Here we're going to bring together storytellers from all walks to encourage and empower you to craft your best story. Be sure to join us over on our YouTube channel as we've been going through our Preptober series, getting ready for NaNoWriMo. I've thought about releasing some of those shows here on the audio podcast channel, but I, they really deserve the video treatment as well because we do a lot of stepping through things that you kind of need to see. So I'm going to put a link to the YouTube channel and those videos specifically in the show notes of this episode. So if that interests you and you're doing NaNoWriMo this year, click on over there and watch the three episodes we've uh, released so far. Our final Preptober video will release this Wednesday coming up. So join us over there. And we are live here in the StoryCraft Cafe. Uh, I am Hank Garner, your host, as always. Today, Katie Shepard joins me. She has a brand new book that released yesterday, if you're joining us live. Sweeten the Deal is the name of the book, and what a fun uh, read this is. Uh, it takes a lot of tropes, turns them on their head, and just has a lot of fun with uh, you know a story that you might might think that you know, um, but completely reinvents it. Such a fun book to read. Katie, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. I'm excited to have you. Uh, Katie, I like to begin uh, the show with a fun question uh, to kind of kick things off and get things going. And one question I love to ask people is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Um... So I, I write for a living. Um, I am a lawyer, very, uh -huh. you know, which, which involves some storytelling craft, but the stories are often about um, contracts and very boring things. <laughs> um, so I had been doing that for almost a decade before I um, walked out of uh, The Last Jedi and um, wondered if anybody else had uh, thought that Kylo Ren and Rey were about to kiss in that movie, went onto the internet and found an article about the existence of fan fiction. Uh, and thought, oh well, that sounds interesting. I'm going to I'm going to check that out. And it turns out that I was not alone in thinking that those two ought to kiss. <laughs> led me to my first writing community, which was, um, which was fan fiction, um, which was a wonderful, fun, loving, supportive place, um, you know, for several years before I, I made the turn to, um, uh, traditional publishing. I've, I've not had a lot of experience, uh, with fan fiction, but I've always thought that, um, what a great way to, um, to get your feet wet in storytelling and kind of, um, you know, to uh, to take an existing uh, world and uh, in, in an existing story um, so you can uh, kind of can see how the bones of story work, but then feel free to kind of play around in that playground. And I know I'm, I'm mixing all kind of metaphors and but um is that kind of what you found in fan fiction, just kind of the the stability of an existing story and the ability to kind of play around with it and see what else can be done? What, what exactly did did you get from from writing fan fiction? It, it, first, it's just starting to write. Um, yeah. you know, a lot of people have stories that they want to tell and then they don't. Um, and the barriers to entry in fan fiction could not be lower. Um, mm. Anyone can start and immediately post it on archive of our own. And then there is a community that is very supportive and provides you know, immediate feedback you know, that, that you know, loves to talk about what you've written to you know, help you make it better, to talk about, um, talk about characters, to talk about prose, to talk about um, different literary techniques. And I, I think that 
people who, who have not been part of the fan fiction world would be surprised at sort of the breadth of things that are out there and the way that these communities form where they talk about um, it as though it is literature and write it you know, with the same level of care and attention to what they're doing as people in um, in publishing. Um, certainly something that I, I did not know about, you know, that I did not expect and that was um, a really wonderful point of entry to me. It, it just writing felt like a muscle that got stronger the more I did it. Um, you know, so after you have turned out a few hundred thousand words, um, you know, with other people who are cheering you on and sort of have the same um, love for stories and characters that you do, it, it, it just it really solidifies writing as a thing that um, that feels good and is is fun to do. You you mentioned that Star Wars was the world that initially brought you in, but were there other worlds, other characters that that got your attention? Oh sure, um, you can find. It, it, I, I'm most of it is still up there. It, it was a number of different fandoms, and I I did not really. A lot of people start when they're teenagers and, and are raised in in this fandom world. I I was not. I just did not encounter it until I was already an adult. But there are fandoms for books. There are fandoms for movies. There are fandoms for TV shows. Um, and a lot of people are participating in multiple at the same time. Um, so, I, I mean, I was in several, you know, on very, you know, it, it was uh, this experience where I was on Twitter, I was on Tumblr, I was on Discord, I, you know, I was you know, reading fan fiction, I, I was looking at these, you know, literary analyses of the original canon works, you know, I was chatting with people on multiple platforms at the same time, and it was, um, and then there was the pandemic, when all of that felt yeah. like it was, it, it, was heightened and more intensive because everybody was in their living room all day long. <laughs> right. And we were all looking for some sort of community that, that even if we couldn't be present with other people in the flesh, in a lot of cases, I, I feel like that was a, a real boon for online communities. And it sounds like this was the perfect place to, you know, for an online community to really stand up and, uh, and embrace each other, so to speak. And I was lucky enough to be part of this community with a number of different really talented writers who were thinking about moving from writing fan fiction to fun to moving into publishing, um, in some cases making that a career because they had... Um, they had either made connections during fandom or, you know, had, had absorbed enough information about how the publishing industry worked to make that transition. And so, you know, I was by no means the first one to do it, but seeing pe other people go through that process, what that looked like, um, thinking about it, you know, along with them, you know, it, it, that all came together during the first couple of years of the pandemic that I felt like it was something that I could do too. I'm I'm glad you brought that up because that was going to be the next thing that I asked you was um I, I'm sure there are lots of people that just enjoy writing in someone else's world and the community aspects and the the aspect of just taking a familiar story, putting your twist on it, letting these characters continue to live and other stories and adventures. I got there. There's lots of upside to this that I can tell. Um but what is it that makes you want to make that jump? Because I'm sure there are plenty of people that are just perfectly happy to just stay in, in that world. Um, and, and that's, that's all they ever need. Um, but what is it that happens to a writer that says, okay, I've, uh, I've enjoyed this time, but now I have stories that I want to tell with all new worlds and characters. What's that jump like? Well, I think a lot of us were edging further and further away from the source material until it was, um, you know, almost unrecognizable. And, and at that point where you think, you know, you are so far from, you know, the, the original material that why don't you take that leap of faith and make the jump? You know, and that's kind of what happened with, uh, is E.L. James that, that did the 50 shades books that was originally, um, 
Twilight fanfic, if I remember yeah, it was right. Twilight fan fiction. You see, I, you see it happen in several different genres. I think that the most you know, that the the authors who tend to be most open about it are romance authors. There are a number of romance authors who are very proudly, you know, former fan fiction writers. Um, right. You also see science fiction and, and romance authors. You see um, you know, authors like Naomi Novik, who was one of the founders of Archive of Our Own, still you know, writes romance, writes YA, writes science fiction fantasy, and also still posts really good fan fiction on, on Archive of Our Own and has been very supportive of the fanish community for decades. Um, I think so, it's you know, easier to talk about even if it's not necessarily happening more than it, than it used to. Yeah. So what was that? Uh, what was the, the story idea or was it a, a character that um, what, what was it that, that kind of led you uh, to create a world all your own? What was there a, a catalyst moment? Was there a character that walked onto the stage of your mind? Uh, you know, what was it that, that was, kind of the the first instigation for that first original story you wrote um so so this book that um that just came out yesterday sweeten the deal this was actually the original novel that i went on sub with it is my it is my interesting it is my second book but it is the book that i wrote first and queried and went on sub with um and it was I, i approached it you know, very close to the way that I would have done if I were writing what we call modern AUs, alternate universes, um, and, and thought about, you know, a, a funny trope and how I would twist it. How would I do it in a new way? Um, you know, this is, you know, it, it, I mean, it is a, it is a ridiculous premise. This, you know, it, it is a common trope that you see in multiple fandoms, this sugar yeah. baby AU, you know, because it is a fun way to bring the characters into contact to make, you know, to, to, you know, put them in this ridiculous situation. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to invert it, you know, it, it see what it looked like, you know, if I, changed the genders, changed the typical scenario, you know, would that be funny was, <laughs> was really the main question that I was going at is, would it be funny if you put a very serious, um, you know, dignified, you know, man in a situation where he is the sugar baby to somebody younger and more naive, you know, and then I built out from there, you know, I just because, you know, one of my favorite, um, you know, storytellers, um, um, is Patrick Weeks, who who doesn't write romance. He uh, they write um, science fiction and fantasy, and they are the lead writer for the Dragon Age um, franchise. In addition to being a um, traditionally published author, and their catchphrase is "ridiculous premise." executed faithfully that you start with something really silly and then just commit to the bit, you know, treat it as though it is, you know, a, the, the absolute foundation um, for an actual world that you are going to build. So I, I took this inverted sugar baby trope and then just, you know, acted as though I was going to stack an entire real world on top of it. I love that. Um, I, I heard someone say one time and, and, Whoever said this, please forgive me. Um, I'm I'm not grasping it right now, but they said that they wanted to write um, a a cowboy western, um, but they weren't confident enough to to get all the details right, and so they figured, well, if any time that you're in that situation, just introduce a unicorn into the story, and then all bets are off. It can be whatever you want it to be. So you. They wrote, I think it was two authors, they wrote um, a cowboy western, but with unicorns and uh, but but approached it from from the uh, from the perspective of this is absolutely real. There's nothing tongue in cheek about it. They just happen to be horses with horns and and they had the most fun with it because, you know, once you give it credence and, and you know, let it have the, the gravitas that, you know, that any you know real story deserves that, you know, it it became a phenomenal series for them. So um, that sounds fantastic. I mean, right? I, I, lo- I love that idea that you know, it just do, don't break character as you are telling this ridiculous story. Yes. Yes. And it was, you know, it was a lot of fun for them to write. And, um, 
So you know, I've always loved that idea. Just introduce something a little ludicrous, but then give it all the love and attention that it deserves and, you know, let it be its thing. Um, you you said something that, that fascinated me, and um, you said that your your new book, uh, Sweeten the Deal, was actually the first book that you wrote and, you know, tried to go to market with, and um, and you'll have to tell us the story in a minute, but it, it didn't sell for whatever reason. But then you published Bear With Me Now, and that was successful. Um, I, I hear from authors a lot about um, – they will write a novel and um, for whatever reason, it doesn't sell it. it you know, it doesn't um, no one picks it up. And so they they start writing a second novel and then, you know, hopefully that one sells. But they kind of abandon that first project and it becomes a desk drawer novel or trunk novel or, you know, we've got all kind of terms for, you know, the thing that doesn't sell. Um, and. Rarely will you see someone go back to that thing that didn't sell and, you know, try to, you know, shape it up or whatever, whatever the, the deal is. Um, and, uh, but then on the other hand, you, there are people that will write one novel and it doesn't sell and they'll just go back to re-editing and they'll just work on it and work on it and work on it until it does sell. And um, the the attitude difference between, you know, someone that will write a book, it doesn't sell and they just abandon that or, or put it to the side, start another one until something does hit. Um, and maybe it's that, that the author doesn't have the, uh, you know, the, she or he hasn't accumulated the skills yet to tell the story they want to sell, or maybe the market's just not ready, w- whatever the, the situation is. Um, but the difference in people that will set a, a project aside, go to something completely different, or the people that will just keep at it until this thing is ready, whether the writing is ready or the market is ready, whatever. But it sounds like you kind of did both. Um, what happened? To tell me the story. I'm fascinated. So it's a little different. This one, you know, I, I queried with this book, Sweeten the Deal, um, you know, and joined up with my agent um, who then – you know, so, you know, went on sub, you know, went on submission with this book. And this book was always um, imagined a, as part of a, a, a trilogy, which is, um, you know, less, let, maybe less, slightly less common in contemporary romance than in historical fiction or in historical romance. But, um, you know, I imagined these, you know, loosely related characters um, and had three different stories I wanted to tell. And this book, Sweeten the Deal, was going to be first. Then there was a second going to be a second book involving um, two characters that are introduced in the book. And then there was going to be a third book um, that was going to uh, involve one of the characters who's in all three books and then a a new character. Um, And that third pitch for what was going to be the third book was actually the the, uh, sort of the hook for Bear With Me Now. And when my editor got the pitch for the trilogy, she said, actually, I like really like this, um, you know, this third pitch, you know, I really love bears, you know, tell me more about the bear book, you know, <laughs> could I have the bear book first? Um, and you know, of course I was like, well, of course you can have whatever you want, you know, <laughs> right. you know, I'll write whatever you want me to write. Um, and so I, I, you know, turned around and, um, it, you know, reimagined how a few characters met and were introduced and bear with me now was, um, was my debut when it was, Plan to be the third book of the trilogy. Uh, you know, and I, I did have to do make some changes to my outline to uh, you know introduce characters in a different way than I'd planned. Um, but it, it was the same characters that I'd been thinking about you know from the beginning. Um, so we had Bear Book first. Um, now we have Sweeten the Deal, which was going to be the first, which was you know, with the original plan. And then next year, we're going to have um, No One Does It Like You. Wow. So um, you had Sweeten the Deal written already, and you had um, a, a, 
an outline for the bear book. Um, how long did it take you to, to write that second book? Well, you know, with the, uh, with the knowledge that someone was interested in it, did, did that make a big difference? You know, you, you write that first book in complete anonymity. No, no one knows about it. No one's expecting it, but there's something about that second book when, when people are expecting something and th- does that, you know, change the level of tension? Does that change the ferocity with which you write? Uh, you know, what, what yeah, was- I, I had a deadline. Um, mm. People talk about sort of the sophomore uh, curse that it, it is really hard to write your second book yeah. now, but that for most people, that is a book that they are writing while they are, while their first book is already out for trade reviews. And so they are for the first time they are getting, um, independent feedback, um, on their first book while they are writing a book. Um, and that wasn't the case for me. You know, I, I had, uh, you know, I, it was just, it was just me and, and my editor. Um, you know, and I had a very short deadline. Um, you know, I wrote it in, um, about four months. Um, and it, it was different in that, you know, it was a book that I had promised somebody that I would write. Um, it was a book that, you know, I was contracted to write, but, it, you know, obviously nobody could read it until I had written it. I wasn't getting, you know, reviews or, or feedback, you know, until I you know had to be like, okay, this is the book. This is it. You know, I hope it is what yeah. you were expecting and send it to my editor. Um, uh, you know, whereas sweeten the deal, you know, it, it, I wrote it over, well, I, you know, the first draft came together over just a couple of months, but, you know, had much, many more rounds of feedback, you know, as a, the novel that I was querying. Um, so I, I feel like I didn't get into that, uh, you know, that, you know, sophomore curse where you're writing as you're getting feedback until I was writing my third book. Um, because the third book that I turned in a couple of months ago, you know, I had to you know, draft and revise, you know, after uh, Bear With Me Now was out in the world. So I feel like I got to write two second books and, and you know, deal with both sort of the deadline pressure, um, you know, question, imposter syndrome questions. Right with me now and then write a book, you know, while I'm getting active feedback on my, on my writing with bear with me now. Um, so hopefully that means that the next book is going to be super easy, super smooth. It'll be right. <laughs> the fourth book, you know, I should have, you know, it, it should happen just as uh, easily as the, the ones that I was writing with my friends in my living room. Well, I, I, I know that every writer I've ever talked to deals with um, imposter syndrome and that's, you know, just where, you know, the 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 blank page is the great equalizer for no matter whether you've published one novel, never published a novel or you've published a 100 novels. Everyone starts a book with the same blank page and there's nothing there and you have to show up as the writer and, you know, let the magic flow. Um, but, you know, after. After you published a couple, you know, you you kind of push the imposter syndrome to the side because you you have proven something to yourself and to the rest of the world. I can complete a novel. I can get from beginning to end. I can create characters that that someone resonates with. Someone likes the book. Um, You know, I can develop a plot that goes somewhere. You know, they're they're even though everyone deals with it, there, there's a certain level of confidence that comes from just completing something and having a history with something. So was, was that third book where you're actually dealing with the sophomore issues kind of in a, in a backward sort of way. Um, do you, do you have, um, some of those things to rely on? You know, I, I know I feel this way, but I have accomplished this in the past and, and people have loved it. Does, does that help? I, I mean, I, because I write, you know, very much to spec for my day job as a lawyer, you know, I, yeah. I, I tend to think, you know, there is going to be never did I question my ability to turn out 90,000 words along the outline that I delivered. Um, right. 
the, the, the question is, you know, nailing sort of the promise of, of the premise of, uh, you know, making it something that is not merely, you know, effective, but, you know, pleasurable to read because that, I mean, that is the, you know, the, you know, the big point of the romance, you know, the romance genre, uh, right. you know, that, that you are going to feel good about yourself in the world when you, you know, when you close this book, um, you know, in doing that, you know, with, with, um, you know, the voices of the you know, worst critic that you got on the first book, you know, because fanfic, you know, the community is so supportive. Um, there's a big, you know, you, know, you, you you do not get, you know, mean criticism when you are writing fanfic. You you will get constructive criticism, but you will never get right. somebody just saying, this is terrible. I, and I hated it. Um, you know, it, it, you know, I had to learn to, you know, protect myself from, you know, people who didn't like it because people who've bought a book, you know, are entitled to not like it. Um, sure. I do not need to hear about it. Um, and, and figuring that out halfway through writing book three. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you are a practicing attorney. You've mentioned your day job a, a couple of times. Uh, did you, did you have to develop um, some sort of work life or work work balance, you know, juggling your life as a, as an attorney, your life as an author and your private life, you know, where you have relationships that you have to maintain and all of this. Was that ever a struggle kind of dividing up the time and figuring out, you know, which hat you were going to wear at which time? Well, it, it's more that this was my fun and relaxing hobby that I turned into a side hustle. So, you know, it, it, it took a while for me to realize, you know, I'm not writing more than I did when this was for fun. But why am I, you know, so much more drained? And I realized, well, this was the thing I did for fun. Now, this is a thing that I am doing, you know, much more seriously. I'm going to have to you know, find something else. I'm going to have to replace, you know, the, that time to just decompress and, um, relax. You know, I'm still writing on lunch breaks and, you know, evenings, but I'm, I'm also going to have to find some time just for, you know, self care. Um, because I can't you know, think that I'm going to feel, you know, as, as good about myself as I did when I had one job and a fun hobby. Now that I have a day job and a night job. Right. Right. Um, let's talk about sweeten the deal for a minute. Caroline and Adrian, t tell me about these characters. You know, you mentioned that you wanted to take a, a tried and true trope and kind of turn it on its head. Um, was that the, the initial idea for this book, just taking something that everyone's familiar with, but inverting it and just seeing what, what comes out of that? Yeah, it, it's the, the sugar baby AU. You will find them in most fandoms, you know, it's, and it is, you know, it is a setup for a lot of romance novels where you yeah. have, you know, a, a character and it's almost always the, the, you know, a, an older, wealthier man who is trying to commodify his relationship with a, you know, younger, more naive woman. And then of course, you know, feelings nonetheless, you know, persist or develop, you you know, despite yeah. the attempts to commodify the relationship and use it to create, you know, dis, you know, emotion, you know, maintain emotional distance between the characters. Um, and I just thought that it would be fun if, um, what if it was the young naive woman who had the money and the power that money, you know, gives you in a relationship? What if things were a little bit more even on, on the power scales? And, you know, what if I, I changed nothing else about the personalities of the people involved? Um, um, and, you know, left them to, you know, you know, to, to deal with, you know, this, um, you know, this inversion and the expected, you know, um, distribution of power between, you know, an older man and a younger woman. I love it. I love it. Um, so then do we do we get to play with uh, some of the other dynamics of, uh, that we see in uh, in in you know, the, the enemies to lovers or enemies to friends and then, you know, enemies to, to lovers. Do we, do we get to see some of that in the book? And we do, you know, I, I like to describe this as sort of fake dating to friends, to lovers. Um, 
you know, because you know, one of the most fun things to me about writing this was just that Adrian is horrified the entire time that he is in this situation. <laughs> that you know, he is somebody who you know, thinks of himself as very, you know, as a very respectable person, as a person who you know tries to do the right thing. Um, you know, who who is you know, as one of his friends says, you know, surprisingly conventional for an artist. Um, <laughs> and you know, him constantly, you know, just being appalled that this is where he is in life, that he is, you know, getting a thousand dollars a week from this young woman from the sticks, uh, you know, who doesn't even want to sleep with him. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, writing his, it just gives me an opportunity to have him, you know, responding, you know, in this, you know, fun, silly way to every situation I put them in. Yeah. Um, you've mentioned a couple of times the word that that some writers love and it strikes fear in other writers and that's outline. Um how do you approach story in the beginning and and uh how much how much does your pre-writing uh take up in your process like how how detailed do you lay the story out before you start drafting so a thing that i learned to do from fan fiction is not to start unless i know how it ends you know i need to know where i'm aiming for otherwise you know i can just get lost i can't completely you know, fly by the seat of my pants i know where i want to aim i've got some ending image i've got some resolution in mind um i don't like to have every single scene outlined you know i like to have sort of islands you know a chain of islands yeah. so i know where I'm starting. I know some places I want to hit along the way and then find myself between those places. Um, you know, it, it, that's how I've, I've really found that I get the best payoff as if I know I've got a few really good moments. And then I focus, you know, on getting there and setting those up that, uh, you know, if I've got the big, you know, beats, I don't tend to worry too much about each individual scene, how I'm moving between them. Yeah. I, I like to use the the roadmap analogy um, because I, I too like to know how it's going to end before I begin. But like if you're driving from California to New York, you can go along the south. You can go, you know, from Arizona to Texas and, you know, through the, the deep south and then turn and go up. Or you could, uh, you know, go across the Midwest and through Utah and Colorado and, you know, then the Missouri and, you know, Chicago and you go that way, you're going to end up at the same place, but they're going to be wildly different experiences along the way. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I like that, too, that having some some points along the way that, you know, you're going to hit um, and then allowing yourself the freedom to kind of create spontaneously in the confines of that thing that you've created. I like that. Um, Sweeten the Deal is available everywhere now. Go visit your local bookstore and pick it up. If you don't have a great local bookstore, we're going to put links to it in the show notes where you can grab it from Amazon. Uh, it's available in paperback or Kindle or audiobook. Um, Katie, have you listened to the audiobook yet? I, you know, when that Bear With Me Now came out, I was very excited to hear the audiobook. You know, I picked out the audiobook narrator and so I made sure to get a copy. And when I tried to listen to it, you know, I lasted about. <laughs> 30 seconds before just cringing into the sun. Oh no, I wrote those <laughs> words and somebody else is saying them out loud. So I just, I can't do it. <laughs> I understand. I, you know, I love my narrator. I've listened to her other books. You know, she is wonderful. I just cannot listen to her say words that I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understand that. We'll sweeten the deal available everywhere now. We'll have links to it in the show notes. Go grab it today. Katie, if people are just discovering you and want to follow along for all the fun that is to come and, and you know, dig into your back catalog, is there a place online that is a good place for them to start? Um, I try to be funny on Instagram. I'm at Katie Shepherd Books on Instagram. And then my website is katieshepherd.com, where it, I have links to things um, related to me. Excellent. We'll link those up to make it easy for folks to find you. Katie, this is so much fun chatting. We're going to post links to sweeten the deal. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank you for having me. 
that's our episode for today. There's so much more to come as we talk to authors about the craft of writing, but also the business of publishing. Be sure to subscribe to the StoryCraft Cafe podcast in your favorite podcast app so that you never miss an episode. The StoryCraft Cafe is made possible by Dabble. Writing a book is challenging. Your writing tool should not be. Dabble is an easy-to-use online writing tool packed with helpful features that allow beginning novelists and published authors to create amazing stories. Visit us at dabblewriter.com and start your free trial today. Thanks for listening.